Can you all hear me okay? And um, and Davy can take it away. Morning everybody. Can you all hear me okay? Oh, that's good. Fantastic. Okay, what I wanted to just share with you was um, some of our reflections on running our first MOOC at Sheffield Hallam, which was Enhancing Prostate Cancer Care. Um, we delivered this October-November time last year over a period of five weeks. Quite exciting for ourselves in the university, obviously, it had been the first MOOC that we offered, so... <laughs> Not surprisingly, the institution was a tad nervous about um, possible institutional risk. It was also the first time PebblePad had been used as a platform for delivering a MOOC as well, so I guess from a business point of view there was an element of risk for PebblePad as well. Um, but the way I pitched it was that actually in reality there's only two possible outcomes here, success or learning. And in reality, not surprisingly, the outcome was both. So. The way we organised and structured this was we had an orientation week, um, that was quite important, I'll come back to that later, followed by four themed weeks and you can see what the foci of each of the weeks were there. We delivered it via the workbooks feature, hence the strapline the MOOC in a book, which only kind of works in a Geordie or a Staffordshire accent I've discovered, so depending where you're from that may not translate. But clearly the interesting thing from my point of view was I wanted to see whether we could actually deliver the MOOC through the personal learning space, and given that I'd had some experience delivering distance learning modules using Paddlepad, I do all of my modules in that way, then I was quite... Um, optimistic about the possibilities. The aim of the MOOC was really we were supporting prostate cancer care and we were trying to get together a group of key stakeholders from across the planet in conversations about ways in which we could enhance the prostate cancer journey and hopefully crowdsource and generate some recommendations for enhancement as well. <coughs> The key thing from our point of view in terms of how we put this together was that educators, patients, carers, allied health professionals, spe uh, specialist nurses, doctors, as well as Prostate Cancer UK, students and PebblePad, there were representatives from each of those areas involved in the design, the development, the delivery and the evaluation. And the key thing from our point of view in terms of the strapline that we gave overall was that it's all about the conversation. This mirrors our experience of running distance learning courses at Sheffield Helm for quite some time now where the content is very much used as the catalyst but the key learning comes from the conversation and in this context clearly we were trying to get people to share practice and generate ideas about the way in which we could enhance the patient care pathway. I'll briefly just touch on some of the aspects of the learning design. So we run it in a workbook environment, clearly this presentation is in a web folio, but the functionality is similar. So for example, the way it was organised was that it would be, once you're in your workbook, you have one click out to a resource. So for example here, this is the open all, the access all areas resource that um, one of our learning technologists developed for us and then one click and you're back in. So what we didn't want was for participants to actually have to engage with all the functionality that PebblePad offers. So once they logged in, clicked into the workbook, it was literally one click out, engage with a resource or a forum, type what they wanted and click and they're back in the workbook. So it was to try and make the technology as unobtrusive as we possibly could. Orientation week was really important. This is based on our experience with running distance learning for sort of a decade or so really, and that it's crucial that you get the participants familiar with the platform, help to build the confidence and also troubleshoot any issues that are arising in terms of access. So that, that, that was key and that was very important, particularly in this context where more than 50% of our participants had never undertaken an online course before and over 95% had never done a MOOC before. So we had a massive range of digital capabilities and skills. The content was made open so they were able to take it away, recycle, mash it up, repurpose and they also got three readers from key journals that were involved in helping us put this together as well which was great. Another key feature we wanted to build in was because we're using the workbooks and everybody takes the workbook away and they've got their content, 
but they've also got evidence of their interaction with the MOOC as well, so they can utilise that for CPD. Hence, again, we talked about it in the context of a MOOC to go. We wanted this to also be a personal learning journey, if that was the route they wanted to undertake. There was no compelling people to participate in either the synchronous or asynchronous forums and activities that we, uh, that we utilised, but clearly because we targeted key stakeholders, we very much hoped they'd bring their collective wisdom to bear. A um, little more about that later. We also integrated some social media, and we used Twitter for this. Each Thursday we had a tweet chat, and we also had a Twitter account for the MOOC as well. Also important in the context of this being about the conversation, sharing practice and ideas, we wanted the community to express their digital voice. So some of it was about fostering confidence in a number of the participants, many of whom have never done an online course before. We also built in a recognition and reward pathway with the use of open badges. Again, this was not something we've done in our sector. There's no record of traction in our sector on this, so we wanted to test the amount of interest to this. And the way it worked was, each week there was an online activity. If they undertook the activity and met the criteria, they would get an open badge to recognise that. But more about that later. Feedback was important from our perspective as well in that it was an ongoing process, shared and integral. So any feedback they provided to us at the end of each week, for example, or on various activities that they've been undertaken, were collated and put back into their workbook because they owned the feedback and they shared the feedback, so they had it back in their workbooks as well. And the other feature we built in was an opportunity to aggregate the learning for credit so they could apply for RPL at the end. Now, in terms of the way each week was organised, the weeks were very much a set up standalone, and individuals could just, just look at particular weeks if they were interested. Certainly, we had a number of end of life care practitioners who said to us at the outset of the course, I may not actually come into the course during weeks one and two, but weeks two and four I'm particularly interested. And that's fine, because although the course was a coherent whole, they were also set up as standalone weeks, so it enabled people to dip in and out according to their. their needs and preferences and so on. Each week we had a weekly blog, which was obviously themed in accordance with the themes of the MOOC, and that was supported by Prostate Cancer UK clinical nurse specialists who did an excellent job there in posing questions, issuing challenges, um, supporting discussion, and responding to queries from participants as well. We also had an article of the week feature. Um, Every Wednesday we then ran a webinar, so this was one of the live synchronous sessions where our expert of the week was involved. So in week one, for example, we had this excellent webinar from Dr. Jonathan Rees, absolutely brilliant. That was really well received. The webinars were recorded so that people could either review them afterwards at their leisure or if they'd not managed to get to the live recording, clearly they could, they could look at the recording subsequently. We followed Webinar Wednesday with Tweet Chat Thursday, and the questions on the Tweet Chat tended to arise from the webinar and the discussions that had been going on in the early part of the week. Not everybody wanted to engage with Twitter, that's fine, but on the Thursday we did a live Tweet Chat, storified the Tweet Chat, and then that was embedded back in their workbooks. So even if they didn't participate in the Tweet Chat, or even if they don't engage with Twitter, they could see what went on in terms of the Storyfy. Plus we also incorporated a feature called Tagboard, which for non-Twitter users just allows them to click on and have a look and see what some of the key tweets were that were going along as, um, as, the, as the weeks progressed. Each week we had an online we had an online chat, we had an online task, sorry, which we called an activity, and there was an optional open badge claim for activity completion. As we got towards the end of the week, it was then we were kind of trying to pull together what were the key themes, what, were, what was emerging from the week, and whilst we were doing that, we were asking for some rough and ready feedback from the participants as well, so we got them to quickly post in Answer Garden what your perspectives were, so how was the week for you? Uh, do you get you know, an interesting, an interesting graphic, which gives you an immediate perception as to how things are going. And finally, we did the weekly roundup, where we provided a visual and a textual summary of the emerging themes. And again, these were embedded back into their workbooks for them to take away, because clearly they'd contributed to this as well. So that was how it was organised and structured. In terms of the ways in which they interacted with forums, in the same way as we have here, 
we literally put the URL to the appropriate forum, so whether that was taking place in conversations in Atlas, they clicked on the image, took them to the forum, they start typing and contributing and come back into the workbook. If it was the blog, similarly we embedded the blog in the media box, they click on that, it takes them straight to the blog, they start typing the comments and come back in to access the content again. That was how we organised and structured it. As I said at the beginning, key things for us were to try and look at ways in which we could help personalise the learning. Clearly, we can only go so far in this respect. We can't totally personalise it to cater for everybody's individual styles and preferences of learning, that kind of thing. But what we were wanting to do was to provide choices so that they could determine what, where and when they learned. So we delivered, obviously, via a personal learning space. However, it clearly wasn't one of their choosing. But once they have their workbooks, what happens is, following the course, they retain their copy of the workbook, the evidence of their contribution to it, and that's there to take away with them. Alongside the activities that we put into various forums and discussion points and article of the week, etc., we also embedded optional activities in their workbook, which they didn't have to share with anybody. So, for example, we just built in one of the reflection templates that's already in Pebblepad and embedded that in their workbook. So it could help them to reflect on and consolidate their learning as they're going through. So there were a range of optional activities we embedded in the workbook that were entirely personal. They didn't share them with anybody. Um, that, that was for them to utilise as, as they felt fit. Key thing being that clearly we want the learner to be in charge of whether they post at all, if they do, where they post and when they post. So clearly it, it's about giving them choice in terms of trying to personalise the learning. The workbook also provides individual evidence of their learning that they've gained and the extent to which they've engaged with the course, um, which is a really nice feature. They also have the choice to enhance this with open badges if they completed the activities. And although we did have a schedule each week and certain things happened on certain days, it was clearly spelt out to participants that the schedule was indicative and they were quite at liberty to proceed at their own pace. So we had a number of learners, for example, who studied this over a much longer period of time and they were engaging with some of the activities sort of in December and even early January. So some of them did take they did take us upon that. The guidance we set at the outset was we felt we'd set it up such that it would require them to undertake about three to four hours a week. That was that was what we aimed at in terms of the levels of activity. One of the other things we tried to foster was to get them to develop, establish or enhance any personal networks that they may have through the MOOC community. And again, they could do that through Atlas, through the community feature. They could make contact, um, share details, that kind of thing. And I do know anecdotally of colleagues from Canada, for example, that, that met colleagues from the UK through this and have actually come across to visit departments and have a look at how they, they undertake certain things and share practice and so on. We also give them the opportunity to consolidate and enhance their learning for credit via RPL. PebblePad very kindly give them the personal account free for life on completion, hence it really is a MOOC to go in that they can take their personal account and their MOOC and their learning with them at the end of the course. And clearly, it's, it's up to them to decide what they want to get from this. Some of the participants simply listened and watched, and that's great too. I know in the literature there's a lot of reference to these people being lurkers, but I, I like to sort of embrace them as strategic learners, really. What you have to consider is that many of the people that access this are working as full-time healthcare professionals. So they're doing this on lunch hours, evenings, weekends, that kind of thing. So I don't have a problem with people being strategic about this. But Clearly, the fundamental principle in relation to this was we wanted it to be all about the conversation. You know, if you guys have got experience as a patient carer, practitioner, we want you to share that so that we can enhance the patient pathway for this group of patients. Okay, here's a range of the ways in which they engaged in collaborative learning. So through the blog with the nurse specialists, we also had conversations in the workspace. Some really interesting stuff went on there. And one of the nice features about conversations you'll be aware of if you use PebblePad and, and Atlas is the Save Summary button. So they were able to save their contributions to conversations and use that again as evidence of CPD. Similarly, we used discussions around the article of the week in conversations as well, and they were able to save their contribution to the discussion in terms of the article of the week as well. 
webinar Wednesday and, and so on, I've um, fed back on there. But one of the key things, just to show how they did work collaboratively, there are a number of examples of this, not least of which is the tangible output at the end, but they also crowdsourced resources throughout the course of this. So they all uploaded, and this was kindly curated by one of the participants, Patricia, and they all, they all actually found resources, shared those with each other, and um, they're still able to access them subsequently because that's embedded back in their workbook. Okay, key thing in terms of the collaboration was having engaged in a range of conversations, the feedback was collated. So at the end of each week, we pulled that together. But by the end of the course, we had an output where these were the key considerations from the community itself in terms of enhancing prostate cancer care that we were able to feed back to um, the prostate cancer charity. Clearly, there's a lot there, and you can have a look at that at your leisure subsequently. OK, final thoughts. For me, the thing was, although we called it a MOOC, it's, it's not all about MOOCs. It's not even about MOOCs, really, but it's about the role that MOOCs can play as a catalyst for conversations about the nature of online learning and how we might enhance this dimension of our offer in HE. Um, but clearly, Pedipad and the digital workbook did allow us to successfully scale up the online delivery. That was great. Key thing from my point of view, learning design and pedagogy are key. Stakeholder involvement crucially important as well. The technology is merely there to serve as an enabler, and we've got to make that as invisible as possible. The induction and the signposting were crucial. Key thing was we had to be on hand to support and enable the interaction and collaboration so that they could learn from each other. So we learned significantly from this. So we were learners as well as the, the other participants as well. It was a massive learning curve for some of the for some of the tutors. Open badges, certainly we've we've demonstrated there is potential for traction in this sector. We got significant engagement with that part of the activity. Um, and clearly the collaboration with PC UK and Pebblepad added significant value. I just wanted to close with the last word. There's, there's a whole range of stuff I could have pulled off from participant feedback, but these two particularly resonated with me. Um, the first one was from a practitioner in uh, New Zealand who put that quote there. And to actually feel as though you've actually had an impact on somebody's practice and the way in which they deal with patients is really quite significant, and that, that's where we would like to go. But one of the really nice things was we had a participant from Ghana who is currently using the information and the resources and the learning he gained from the MOOC, working with the Ministry of Health in Ghana to try and develop a prostate cancer pathway in Ghana in that one doesn't currently exist at the moment. So that was really pleasing from our point of view. And I think I'm out of time now, so I think I better close there. But clearly, I'll look forward to um, to questions and so on subsequently. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, David. Um, really enjoyed that. Um, has anybody got any quick questions before we move on to Fiona's presentation now? I noticed there was a few that were sort of a, um, uh, asked in the in the chat. Is there any any one or two you want to pick up, David? Um, for Fiona. Um, um, I can only see a few of them at the minute. When we go back to the main screen, I'll I'll I'll, I'll have a look at those and I'll respond okay. while Fiona's presenting. And obviously, I'll field any questions at the end as well. Okay. Cool. Brilliant. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's move, let's move over then.